chapter 2. Uh, and to get us started this morning, as you're turning there, I'm actually curious if any of you know who this guy is. Bring him up on the screen. What's this? Who anybody know who this guy is? All right, say his name out loud. One, two, three. It is Mr. Feeney, right, from Boy Meets World. Uh, some of you uh, may know that, some of you may not. It's actually a show that's de- near and dear to my heart. Grew up that as a, as a kid. Um, and uh, this, this guy, William Daniels, plays Mr. Feeney. He's a teacher in Boy Meets World. And beyond uh, teaching subjects in school uh, to, uh, to his students, he actually uh, often will teach life lessons to Mr. Corey Matthews, uh, that young man right there. Uh, just recently... Um, now, I've been actually binge watching this uh, with my, my girls, uh, and uh, it's kind of a cool. Uh, it's kind of cool when I can bring back my my childhood to my children, and so we've been watching it like last night, like literally, like every night for the last probably week or two. Uh, we've been watching at least one or two episodes of Boy Meets World, and get to hear Mr. Feeney. By the way, he has a very cool dialect, a very way of talking, those kind of things. Uh, but I thought about Mr. Feeney this week as I began to teach, uh, work on this teaching, because this morning we are going to t- uh, talk about. Uh, our topic matter for the morning is we're going to be covering the gift of teaching. The, thus, the reason why I brought up Mr. Feeney this morning, because, of course, he's a teacher. Many of you know that we've been in a message series here at Cornerstone this summer, and actually we're ending this series today called Wired, Living Who I'm Designed to Be, where we're walking through seven spiritual giftings that are in Romans chapter 12, verses 7 and 8, um, and it'll come up on the screen as well. I won't read this whole thing to you, uh, but we've been walking through this week by week by week and looking at each one of these giftings um, and these wirings, and today we're going to talk about the gift of teaching, which is actually a gifting that I have. Um, and actually, I didn't know that I had this gifting until I, uh, years ago in my life, um, in my 20s, jumped into full-time vocational ministry, began to unearth itself, this idea of teaching uh, as I jumped into vocational ministry. I actually found that uh, when I was in college, I was really, really nervous to get up in front of people and do like speech classes and those kind of things. And so I would have thought this would have been far from the thing that would have been my gifting, but it began to unearth that I am absolutely wired to teach. And, and so to be clear, though, I, and I'm going to kind of dive into some things today, that, that was my uh, story. But the truth of the, the matter is that this spiritual gift can be actually exercised in a variety of different ways, this gift of teaching. Uh, it can be like a setting like this in a church service, uh, those kind of things. It could be also in the classroom. It can be through writing and through counseling. And so there are several different outlets for this gifting uh, of teaching Mine just kind of came full circle as I uh, jumped into vocational ministry. But the journey can take various paths, uh, actually uh, so much so that I wanted to uh, show you uh, a video. Um, I've been, each week we've been uh, talking to a couple of people within the church family uh, that, um, that, that have this giftings and, and, and can kind of model this for us. And there are a couple of people uh, that uh, they've actually discovered that this gift of teaching uh, is uh, their gifting as well in their adult life. And so I've asked them to share a bit, little bit this morning. And so uh, take a look at this video and then uh, we will uh, I'll make a couple comments. So throughout my youth, people would tell me, you should be a teacher. Um, you'd be really good at, you know, being a teacher. And I was always like, no, I don't want to be a teacher. Um, and I realized as I got older that I love learning and I love sharing what I've learned. And now as an adult, I'm a homeschool mom of three. Um, I teach a middle school Bible study and I get the opportunity to teach here, um, sometimes on Sunday mornings. Um, I honestly didn't think I had the spiritual gift to teach. Um, I am a teacher by trade. That's what I do. Um, but I thought that to have a spiritual gift of teaching, I needed to be like a biblical scholar and have all sorts of biblical history, which I did not have. Um, and I ended up teaching English overseas for a year and I was meeting with some people doing a Bible study and we took turns teaching and I thought I was completely underqualified. There were actual pastors in the room. There were like people who study the Bible in college. Um, and I did it because I had to, and it turns out it felt very natural to me. And from then I just sort of took hold of of that and took their same, I mean, they kind of gave me a framework to work off of and that helped a lot. Plus when Matt Poorman calls me and tells me I have some sp- sort of spiritual gifting, I've learned that he's usually right. Oh. 
Since teaching just sort of comes naturally to me, especially with my job, I've never really thought about like the the best moments, but I will say that in general, the joy in this in this gifting comes when you kind of see the aha moment. Uh, just like in the classroom, when I look in someone's eyes and I can't explain it, but there's a little bit of a twinkle and there's like a lightness on their shoulders where I realize that I have unlocked something and that God has used me as a vessel to unlock that very thing for this person. Um, so I, I just love it. I love teaching. It is fun to me. It's energizing. Um, I get excited learning new information and I get excited when I get to share it with people and seeing maybe light come into their eyes, understanding or, um, you know, them having come up to me and say like, oh, I've never heard that before. I didn't know that. Um, it's just really life giving to me. And so, um, yeah, it's just something that I'm passionate about and that I enjoy doing. So I think with teaching, sometimes it can be hard to find a captive audience. Um, I know my husband is often at the receiving end of a, a lot of my excited ramblings of things that I've learned. Um, and I don't know that he always loves that. Um, but I think as a woman, it is, um, you often find that you're kind of shoved with the kids. Um, and I love kids. I love teaching my kids. I love teaching my middle schoolers. Um, it's really fun. But I also love teaching adults and I love being able to go to a new level of depth in my teaching and just being able to present even like harder um, topics and things like that. And so um, I think sometimes it's just finding those opportunities um, to be able to teach. Like a lot of spiritual gifts, I think that pride can get in the way. It can be a source of pride where, you know, I might have some sort of vibe of knowing it all or not being able to be taught, but that is definitely a lie. Additionally, just like any spiritual gift, I believe as well, it's very exhausting. I feel like I have to be in teaching mode all the time. And a lot of times that's a responsibility I put in myself. Um, and then I get frustrated if I don't know the answers. Um, and just like doctors need medical care sometimes, I also need to be taught and I need to be challenged. And I feel like I'm often seeking out those mentor figures because so many people are looking to me for the very thing that I'm seeking myself. And those, that gets challenging. All right, so those, uh, that was my friend Stephanie and my friend Abby, the lights will come on eventually. I'll be in the dark. Um, maybe hit, uh, I don't know, I can keep talking. There we go, perfect, all right. Um, so that was my friend Abby and my friend Stephanie, and uh, for both of them, there's been a journey of realizing this, this wiring of teaching um, and really kind of pressing into this wiring of teaching uh, for them in their life, and both of them uh, as school teachers in the setting. Uh, of course, Stephanie mentioned uh, her being able to teach here on the weekends here at Cornerstone as well, uh, and it just seems to be a really good fit for both of them, and I know for me as well. And, and, and so not only is it a good fit, but it's a really important thing. This gift of teaching is actually super, super important. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of scriptures. Jesus Jesus actually, in his last com uh, commandment to the disciples, uh, actually involved teaching, uh, teaching other people, which kind of underscores the importance of this gift as a whole. It says in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, it says, therefore, go make disciples of all natures, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then here it is, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So this is one of the very last things that Jesus tells his crew, right? He says, teach, teach. Now, of course, this was specifically in spiritual things, and we're going to talk more about that later today, but the command was teach, and so it's really important to have those that are gifted to teach, teach. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and through 13 says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and then here it is, and teachers to equip his people for good works or for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. So teachers are important. Teaching is important because it has the capacity capacity, this is what it says, this says, to, to bring growth through understanding and maturity, especially from a spiritual perspective. 
Now, I know that some of you are maybe sitting there going, okay, like, uh, so we got to uh, hang out with the kids today and we're talking about teaching and teaching's not really quote unquote my thing. And, and I wanna just encourage you, if, if you, because right, by the way, some of you, you, you're like, that teaching may not be your thing and that's okay, but, but I want to encourage you to not check out today or disengage today because as I mentioned several weeks ago when we started this series, the truth of the matter is, likely uh, every single one of us, we're gonna encounter a situation sometime this week sometime in the next month or year that we're gonna need to teach. We're gonna need to teach a child. We're gonna teach a kid, a nephew, a a niece or a grandkid. We're gonna need to uh, write an email or a letter that we're gonna have to teach something to somebody else. In the midst of that, we're gonna uh, have to teach uh, in in, in maybe uh, counseling someone, giving somebody some level of counsel or at work. The the truth of the matter is there's moments of teaching all around us. And so I do think that there's something for every single one of us today. Uh, So don't check out today. I think there will be some things for you as well. All right, so with that, said, we're actually going to uh, look then in our main text in Acts chapter 2, where we're going to dive into actually the apostle Peter. Peter's one of the 12 disciples. We're going to actually jump into his very first teaching that he gave after the death of Jesus and take a few things that he does and actually that he says as our points today um, and what a teaching gift looks like. And just a little bit of context about this. Peter delivers this teaching uh, after uh, this, the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. And so there's this moment where the Holy Spirit comes and, and there's the, uh, you might know, have known if you know the Bible about tongues of fire and people are speaking in tongues and there's, there's a lot of spiritual activity going on, right? And so there's some accusations uh, against the people like that they were drinking and that things are kind of crazy and wild and all that kind of stuff and that it wasn't godly, and Peter steps up, and he shares this very first teaching, all right? And so it's Acts chapter 2, verse 14, which says, and we're going to read lots of scripture today, so hang with me, okay? It says, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. He's kind of making a joke. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And then we're gonna skip to verse 32. God raised this Jesus to life and we are all his witnesses of it, exalted to the right hand of God. He was received from the Father. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and was poured out what you now see and hear. Verse 37, just a couple more verses. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day day. So I know that's a lot of scripture there, but I think there's some really good stuff inside that text and that teaching of Peter. And so our title this morning is Wired to Teach. This is our last message in this series. And I have a couple things that I want to make sure and point out from Peter's teaching here in this Acts chapter 2 section that I think are worth noting in reference to kind of a a gifting of teaching, right? And some of you might be uh, discovering that this is kind of how you're wired in the way that uh, like Stephanie or, or, uh, or Abby or myself, but others of you, you might just go, hey, there are some things to grab for those moments, those special moments that you're going to have uh, to teach as well. All right. So before I give this to you, I want to pause and pray. So if you would pray with me and then I'll give you a couple things to think about and write down. So let's pray. Oh God, we thank you so much for an opportunity for us to to gather with our whole church this morning, including the children. And uh, God, we uh, just pray, God, that they're having a great time back in their classes now, but it was great to have them with us today uh, in here. And uh, God, do pray that as uh, they're getting a, a teaching now and that as we look into uh, just kind of unpacking this particular text in Acts chapter 2, 
I pray, God, that you make our hearts, our minds, our souls supernaturally sticky and that we would be, uh, there would be something changed inside of us as a result of our time together, not because of my words and things I've prepared today, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit among us. We invite you to do what you want to do. Encourage us, challenge us, shape us, mold us. Um, do something among us, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we have two points today. You can write this first one on your handout. Being wired to teach includes, number one, regularly articulating clarity and or calls to action. You can write that in. Clarity and calls. Regularly articulating clarity and calls to action. I'm going to do something a little bit different today. For each of these points, I'm actually going to have two particular parts of this text that I want to use as the first part and the second part, and then we're going to go to point two, and we're going to use one for the first part and the second part. And so I see this in, in our text in two verses. The first verse is verse 14, where Peter says this. It's, uh, it says this of Peter. It said, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, I underline that, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, and then I learned this, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. And so Peter stands up, and he spoke up, and amazing major point of why he stood up and, and said something in this moment was to explain and bring clarity to everyone that was listening, right? He says, let me explain this to you. To explain what was happening to, to if I can say it this way, he was going to teach them to clarity, okay, in this moment. He was going to bring clarity by teaching them something, making a complex situation. Because because if, if, you, if you know that text in the story, like it was a little chaotic. I mean, there was tongues of fire. People are talking in tongues. It was a little crazy chaotic in that moment. And so he was like, hey, let me take this thing that seems complex and let me simplify this moment and explain what's happening. And, and so for us, like if we take this in our context today, making the, the people who are gifted to teach or when you have a moment of teaching, uh, they can take, make, uh, take complex things and make them plain and understandable. Um, it, it's what they do. Um, and it could be, I, I want to be clear that it could be a spiritual thing. It could be a non-spiritual thing. It kind of depends on the situation, the conversation or the topic. Uh, but, but making something seem more clear than it was is kind of the goal, Okay. It's, uh, it's why uh, I try to, each week when we come together, we, uh, and I try to, uh, we bring a main text, and I'm trying to bring clarity to the Bible, because how many of you know the Bible can be a little confusing? Right? The, I was actually thinking this week, is how many of you, does anybody remember what series we did last summer? Yes, you're good. You get a candy bar after service. All right. So, so last summer, we did this series. Bring up that, that next slide. We did this revealed, uncovering the mystery of Revelation. How many of you remember that series? Remember we were there? Yeah, and so uh, I, I will tell you this, that um, this is a very, out of all the books in the Bible, I think this is the most confusing book of the Bible, right? And, and uh, so remember last year, our theme last year was that we was going to be a leap year, that we were going to leap forward in things, and I felt like the Lord was saying, hey, if we're going to do this leap year thing, and we're going to leap forward in things, we probably should leap into the book of the Bible that nobody really wants to leap into, and uh, y'all know I was scared of that series. I was really scared of that series because I'm, I'm no biblical theologian. Those, I, I'm a follower of Jesus. I've studied some things and those kind of things. But the reality is I didn't really uh, know all that I was going to need to teach on in the midst of that. But here's what I know as, I, as we tackled that series. You know what I heard more than anything over, over oh, those seven weeks that we did that series is that people were like, wow, this is the first time I feel like I'm understanding Revelation. There are some people in our church that never read the book of Revelation, my wife included, and after the, that was the first time they read the book of Revelation, and the reality is they started to kind of really understand what it was about. It brought us to clarity. And by the way, it brought me to more clarity as I was teaching it. And, and so, so when I was thinking about that, it's like, and I was thinking about Peter in this particular text, it's like he, he like taught them to clarity. I think last summer we got taught to clarity in the book of Revelation. It's what good teachers do. I was thinking then, uh, 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 not just like biblical teachers, but it's like what school, school teachers try to do, right? Like we got a couple of school teachers in the room, which by the way, bless you, God bless you. I know you're getting ready to go back to school and I know you want your summer to be longer, right? But, but like I'm, I'm thinking back to, like, it's, what, it's what like, so I was thinking back to like a teacher, right? Say in basic math and algebra and ge geometry, which by the way, God bless you, uh, Sarah uh, Lutz teaches math. Just pray for her, right? Like, because I'm like, man, like nobody wants to learn math, right? But like at the end of the day, like she has to, so what she's trying to do in the midst of this is she's trying to, to teach these children the how to get the what so that ultimately they can use it in their life, right? Or I was thinking back to, uh, so we just had our team come back from Honduras. Many of you know that we had a team in Honduras. And so they, they probably would have really loved many of them to know how to speak Spanish while they were there, right? And so a Spanish teacher, right, what, she, what a Spanish teacher is trying to do is to effectively help people understand and speak the language so that it could be used to communicate. 
or whatever subject you want to talk about, but the, the idea is to bring clarity and understanding to something that once was unclear. And so this, there's value in this teaching gift. It can be biblical teaching, spiritual things, non-spiritual things, but there's, there's value in this teaching thing. And as I mentioned, there's also going to flesh out in things like um, writing. Like how many of you have ever gotten clarity from, uh, by, by reading a book, right? Raise your hand if you have, right? Okay, good, good. This is active this morning, all right? But like, right? Like we, m- most of us have gotten clarity by, by reading something that somebody else wrote. So they were teaching us by what they were writing, or I also thought about this can flesh out in counseling. Uh, I know many, 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 many people who have gone and, and, and submitted themselves to a counselor and the clarity that has gotten, they, they have received because of, of sitting under the teaching of a counselor has been tremendously helpful. I mean, some of you probably have been in the room, you probably experienced that too, right? And by the way, if you don't know, we have an extremely cost-effective way uh, to, uh, g- to go through counseling. If you're interested in that, if you've never done that and you need clarity in your life, please see me. I can give you details about that uh, after the service sometime during the week, all right? But this can be fleshed out in counseling too. And so the whole point what I'm trying to get at here is that um, those with the teaching gift, like Peter here, have a knack for explaining things, often very complex things, and a knack for bringing clarity, For Peter, this pushed him, if you didn't know, this actually pushed, this moment right here pushed Peter into a life of teaching. This was Peter's very first teaching, uh, but many, many more teachings came after this for Peter, right? It's actually widely held that Peter was the very first priest or pastor in Rome. It's believed that he founded the very first church in Rome and laid the foundation for all other priests and pastors to come, me included. And so here's my thought this morning, is that maybe like Peter... Your first teaching just hasn't happened yet. Maybe for some of you, your first teaching just hasn't happened yet. Again, uh, I, I thought back in college, right? And, and that was more than 20 years ago. Now I'm, I'm kind of getting a little older. But like back in college, I was freaked out to stand in front of a, a group of people and deliver something. And yet it got unearthed in me. My first message came because uh, a pastor here in the area gave me, said, hey, would you come and you would teach at this student ministry thing? How many of you know I was freaked out? But it started to unearth this thing in me. And so here, so here's my thought for some of you today. You may be sitting here today thinking, I am not a teacher and I don't have this teaching gift, but maybe you're like me, maybe you're like Peter, and you are, you're actually a clarifier. You are a teacher, it just has not happened yet. I, I think uh, that's why I've encouraged many of you to, to get involved in, in different things. Begin a small group. Because a lot of times our small groups will actually pass around the teaching to other people. Maybe you need to go on a mission trip. It might stretch you. Like Gary would say, hey, you're giving the thing today. You're, you're, you're going to talk today, right? And maybe you do actually have this gift that you just don't know it yet. And, and then maybe even if you, if you know this is in your gifting, maybe then it might give you a little bit. I'm sweating today. Anybody else sweating in here today? All right. It's hot in here. I've been running around with the kids. Um, maybe for some of you, it's not your gifting, but maybe in those moments... You, you would press in a little bit more to those, those moments that you have at work or it, with your nephews or your nieces or your grandkids or your siblings or, you know what? Like there, there's these moments that maybe the Holy Spirit can show up in that thing for you as well. So that's the first part of this point. Being watered to teach includes regular articulating clarity, but there's a second part. I wanted to really include this today. I, was, I thought about not including and then I decided to include it. And I wanna hit this really quick today. Being wired to teach includes not only regularly articulating um, clarity, but also calls to action. Calls to action. Um, And and what I mean by that is to often do something, like to actually make a change, right? Um, Again, it could be spiritual or non-spiritual, but those who have this gifting to teach, it's, it's not, we don't teach just so we can like, hey, I taught something today. Right, if, if those of, like, if, if Sarah, I'm going, picking on you, Sarah, but if Sarah, right, if Sarah uh, teaches math, but none of her students actually grasp it, I'm thinking she's probably gonna go, well, what am I doing wrong? Right, she's gonna change something. She doesn't just teach just so she teaches math, right? Although her students might think that you're torturing them just by teaching math, but, but that's not the case, right? Like, the reality is, is that it's to teach something and to, to create a call to action and for a change to take place. We actually see this actual change take place in Peter's teaching, in uh, verses 37 and 38 of the text, it says this. It says, when the people heard this, they were, and then I realized they were cut to the heart 
And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized. And so Peter taught in such a way in this particular moment that it says that it cut them to the heart. To make, he made such a compelling case for a call to action that they were overwhelmingly compelled to do something, to make a change, which he communicates is to repent and be baptized. The truth is, no teacher teaches in hopes that, that what they teach will fall flat. No teacher does. But does so in order to create a change agent that will be grabbed and, and, and the life change will happen. It's actually something, by the way, that I pray on my way here almost every single Sunday. It's very rare if I wouldn't pray, and I was praying again this morning on my way in, that ultimately that God would use my preparation in the teaching on Wednesdays and Thursdays of each week and would use my words to call to action something inside all of us, myself included. Each week that we would have an encounter with God in such a way that we would walk out those doors and we would be able to be different than when we came in. By the way, here's, oh, I'm going to go on a tangent. I can't. My wife told me I can't this week. Folks, if you don't come in here, if you don't come in here with the attitude to receive from God in the midst of what we're doing, I think you're missing what church is about. Because by the way, it has nothing to do with this good looking guy. I mean, I am a good looking guy. It has nothing to do with me because the God of the universe wants to encounter you. He wants to have a relationship with you. And the reality is if you come in here going, I guess I'm just gonna check off the box and I'm gonna go home, guess what? You're gonna probably miss something. But if you come in with the attitude of, I was actually having a meeting this week and, and, and I'm gonna share some of the details of the story in a couple of weeks, but I was had a meeting this week and uh, you know I put a social media post out there uh, this week that there are times where I, my phone buzzes and I, I'm afraid to look at it because I'm afraid who's going to yell at me next. You ever been there? And, and so I got this text this week. And it was like, hey, we would like to have a meeting with you. Can we have a meeting with you? And I was like, crap. Because that means usually three things. It usually means one, uh, they're, they're mad at me and they're going to yell at me about something. Two, uh, they're going to leave the church. Or three, there's a major crisis going on and I didn't want to have any of those conversations. And so I said, yeah, we can have a meeting, but what's that about? And uh, he responded, he goes, well, we just, no, there's nothing like any of that stuff. He goes, but uh, we figure you get to hear all the bad news all the time. We just want to tell you all the cool stuff that God's going on in our life. How many of you know, I was like, yeah, we can have that meeting. Let's go. And I said, I don't care if that goes three hours. Let's have that meeting, right? Those kind of things. And, and, and so when I was meeting with this couple, you guys, they're, they're, they're a couple in our church that every single week they come into this room and, and do, no matter what I say, they are looking for what God has for them. And so every week, you know what they do every week? Almost every week without fail, before they leave, they're like, hey, thanks so much, I needed that today. By the way, I'm not that good. I was expecting an amen. All right. But I am, I am not that good. I am not that good. But the, the God of the universe is that good, right? And so I want to challenge you today. And I'm kind of going off my notes a little bit. This is, I'll just tell you, there's been a holy discontent inside your pastor for about the last six months of a couple things. Of one... Uh, I shared not that long ago the, the quote, and I use it all the time from Facing the Giants, that says, your attitude is the aroma of your heart. If your attitude's not right, uh, if, your, if your attitude, what is it? Your, uh, your attitude's the aroma of your heart. If your attitude's not right, if your attitude stinks, your heart's not right. There it is. Sorry, I had to get it in my head. Folks, if you're coming in here with an attitude of, well, I guess it'll just be that crazy bald man telling jokes again. Can I tell you your attitude is not right and your heart's not right? But if you come in here to get, okay, God, I am open to see, because the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, which means that the God of the universe wants to talk to you. Amen. Thank you for that. And so your attitude has to be right when you come into this place. doesn't matter what I say, because you can receive from the Holy Spirit. And then this is the other part of the discontent that's been inside of me. The thing that um, has been frustrating me is that the end of service, we've started to see this change just a little bit, but I feel like I was supposed to, the Holy Spirit was telling me I gotta kind of push you today. So by the way, this is a, I hear this lovingly. I'm not mad at you. I'm just, I feel like my job as a pastor is to press you, to push you, right, into holy things. And so th this was the other thing that, so this call to action thing, right? This call to action. One, one, if you don't come in with the right attitude, you're gonna miss the call to action. But the other part of it is when there is a call to action, you have to respond, I've actually said a lot of times over the last year that I would love to be able to wrangle people and make them do what I think they need to do. Wouldn't that be great? But the reality is it's your choice. 
You have to do it. And so at the end of the service, why we do the way we do the service is that we, at the end of the service, we are going to, and we'll do it again today, we're going to have a call to action, a, a, a ministry time for you to come forward and receive prayer. And here's, what, here's where my holy discontent has been. If you have been around this church for a year, two years, three years, if you've been around all four years and you've never once come up for a prayer time, can I tell you, you've missed a call to action. And hear that lovingly. Because I'm guessing there's been at least one message. If you've been here for three years, right? There's, there, like, there's 52 weeks in a year, right? So do the math. That's 150 times I've, there's been a teaching or something going on here. And you're telling me there's not one time that the Holy Spirit was, was moving you? I, I'm guessing that's probably not the case. And so the reality is that if you, if you have never come up here for prayer, you have missed a call to action. And here's what I want to press you today. And you're going to have an opportunity at the end of the service. Come up. Because the Lord, you may have missed something that the Lord is trying to stir in you. Uh, I'm way off my notes, by the way. Um, maybe something to call you to do something, to, to avoid something, to start something, to end something, to do something else. But you let it fall flat because you didn't come forward. I'm a firm believer in prayer. Prayer changes things. Ooh, I love the, the silence in the room. Folks, prayer changes things. And my heart is for you. And I want your life to be all that it can be. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy or it's going to be perfect and wonderful and roses and all those kind of things. But the reality is if you don't submit yourself to prayer, you might be walking out there into a nightmare. You need prayer. I need prayer. And so if God is stirring you to something, you know what I would love? You know what I would love? I would love that we would be so overwhelmed here, up here, up front every weekend that we don't have enough people to pray. And we need to start, we need to like go after like expanding our prayer team. But you have to respond. By the way, the Lord Lord is uh, is that still small voice. Sometimes it's a loud smack in the face. It could be one or the other, but man, be listening for the voice of God and come up, come up and submit yourself to somebody praying for you. And if it doesn't have to do with the message that weekend, but you got something, come on, sit in the front row and let somebody pray for you. What do you have to lose? Can I tell you what you have to lose? Nothing. You have nothing to lose, but you have everything to potentially gain. So gain something. Okay, my rant is over. I got got another point I got to get to. Oh, crap. Okay. All right, so that's our first point. I'm going to hit this really quickly. Uh, Being wired to teach includes regularly articulating clarity and our calls to action. Point two, you can write this down. I am really sweating up here today. Um, Illuminating scripture, uh, being wired to teach includes illuminating scripture and speaking Jesus. Um. Again, I told you I was going to do a point, uh, scripture and a scripture. So the first uh, of the two scriptures for this particular point um, comes from 15 and 16. It says, this is Peter. He's actually speaking to the crowd. Then he says, these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, and then he, I underline this. This is what is spoken by the prophet Joel. But then I'm not going to show it to you again. But then he goes on to actually recite Joel chapter 2. You can bring that up. Joel chapter two, verses 28 through 32. Okay, where in this point, uh, particular scripture, Joel is actually talking about the fact that, right, if you, if you recall from that, that the Lord's gonna pour out a spirit on people and that there's gonna be all this crazy stuff going on, miracles and signs and wonders and all that kind of stuff. There's essentially saying, hey, this, th- what's happening is what we were told was gonna happen, right? Now, the significance of this is that Peter's listeners would have known the verse of scripture from the prophet of Joel that Peter was referring to. And so if I can say it this way, Peter infiltrated the conversation with a biblical example and biblical truth. He illuminated scriptures to the reality of what was going on. Good spiritual teachers do that. Connect dots in scripture in a particular text, text to text, also to life experiences like we see Peter do in this text. And so it's actually something, right, you often get from me on Sunday mornings, right? We'll get a main text, and I'll try to pinpoint a couple things within the text, and then I'll bring a couple other texts together, and I'll actually apply some things to our lives, right? Infiltrating conversation with Bible verses and Bible stories, illuminating scripture overall to the reality of what's going on. It's something that spiritual teachers do. But I actually, what I want to challenge us today is I actually want to think, challenge you to say, I think it's something that it's really good for all believers to do to infiltrate conversation with scripture, okay? Um, look at a couple of scriptures. Again, text to text, right? De- Deuteronomy verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 18 says, fix these words of mine on your hearts and minds, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. 
Proverbs 7, 1 through 3, this is in the ESV. My son, keep my words and treasure up my commands with you. Keep my commandments and live. Keep my teaching as an apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Why, why do you think that it says in those verses, right, to uh, tie them as symbols on our hands and attach them as, on our foreheads and keep them as an apple of our eye on the tablet of our heart? Uh, essentially, the reason why it's using those kind of physical things for us, it's saying this, it's saying these, these verses saying, know the Bible so that you can infiltrate in the moment when that decision is before us or that conversation is happening or plug in the scenario, we will see things as we need to see things. We, we're reminded of what God says about what we're supposed to do or, or to avoid. We'll, 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 um, we'll be able to uh, really be able to do the right things, help others see how it is to do the right things. We would potentially, if we could infiltrate scripture into more of our conversation, into our lives, folks, me too, um, we would avoid some messiness of life just by illuminating scripture. This whole concept is what we see Peter do in this teaching. He illuminates the scripture in Joel in order to get the people to think correctly about what was happening, to see things as it was supposed to be. And so the question for us, I think, in this, uh, it'll come up on the screen, I think that we need to ask ourselves is this, is do I know the Bible enough to recall it when it's necessary? Do I know the Bible enough to recall it when necessary? Uh, wired or not uh, for teaching, but specifically if we're wired for this, do we know the Bible enough? I think a good question to ask, maybe something that could motivate us if the answer is no, really in general, right? And so that's the first part of this point, being wired to teach includes illuminating scripture. The second part, and I'm gonna end with this, being wired to teach includes speaking Jesus. Can you bring that uh, point up one more time? Thanks, buddy. Um, speaking Jesus. I sort of just uh, and kind of implied this in the last few minutes as I walked through things, but the fact is that we see Peter talk about Jesus big time in this teaching. Big time in this teaching. Just to remind us of what uh, he said, I'm going to read it to you again. It'll come up on the screen, uh, starting in verse 22. He says, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to, to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of the wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses to it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out on what you now see and hear. And then last, 40 and 41, with many, words, he, with many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 people said yes to Jesus because of a teaching. He spoke the name of Jesus. He taught Jesus. He laid out what is really referred to as the gospel. He infiltrated the situation with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And by doing so, 3,000 people, how many of you know 3,000 people is a whole heck of a lot of people? 3,000 people gave their lives to him that day, became followers of Jesus, had their lives transformed and changed forever, all because G Peter spoke Jesus. He taught Jesus. The truth is, it changed lives. The name of Jesus changed lives. Look, what, what we see from Peter in our text in Acts chapter two is that he spoke Jesus, taught Jesus. And if I can say it this way, we, I wrote it in my notes, he, strongholds were broken. Battles were won. Darkness vanished for 3,000 people. Folks, what would it look like? What would it look like if we would do the same? If we would speak Jesus, if we would teach Jesus, wired or not, would 3,000 people come into the kingdom? Come on, somebody. By the way, it's why I do what I do. It, it, it's why I've given my life to this. Uh, I, I pray that the day that we would be able to be in this room and there would be standing room only. Actually, I would love it that we have to bust out that door because there's so many people in this room. I have been praying. By the way, if you aren't praying for this, I would enjoy, uh, ask you to join me in praying that the Lord would bring revival to our, our area to this region, to our state, to our country, to the world. Man, you know, there are places all over the world where like there are moves of the spirit of God. We just got people back from Honduras. And the, the thing that Gary told me this morning is that the spirit just moved big time. And yet sometimes here in Indiana, it can, be, it can feel just stagnant. Why? Because we're not hungry. 
Let's get hungry for, to, to speak Jesus, to just to share Jesus, because that was the whole point of going over there, like to feed people, to clothe people, and tell them about Jesus. Maybe we need to speak Jesus a little more, and maybe we have, like, it, I know y'all don't want people sitting on your laps, but maybe we'll have to have people sitting on your laps because we'll speak Jesus. And I, I, I didn't mean to yell at y'all this morning, but I think this is something I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about teaching, but I'm also passionate about, about letting God call us to things and being calling to other people things and, and ultimately to speak Jesus and things. I think it's what we see modeled by, G, by Peter here in this teaching, both illuminating scripture, speaking Jesus. And so I'm going I'm to wrap up that point. Be, uh, point two is being wired to teach includes illuminating scripture and speaking Jesus. And, I, and so um, with that, why don't you stand?